Anna Marie mentioned, uh, this is the first one in our series, but we have a series of, of uh, talks that, uh, that have, cover various aspects of accessible IT. And mine's the most general and probably the least technical, um, but it's an overview of some of the things you need to think about in order to make your online learning opportunities accessible and inclusive. Um, and so uh, it'll cover some technical things, but also some non-technical things um, and include 20 tips, uh, most of them very easy to do, uh, that uh, can help you make your course more inclusive. I go with she and her. I'm Cheryl Bergstaller uh, here in UWIT, uh, Director of the Accessible Technology Services Group. So uh, the Access Technology Services has two units, uh, the IT Accessibility Team, and that started in 1984. It's just part of another team, um, but it's fully funded by the University of Washington. And here we have a group of IT accessibility specialists uh, that can that focus on making sure that the university procures, develops, and uses uses accessible technology. That would be for faculty, students, staff, and also in the case of websites, etc., uh, for visitors to our campus. But in 1992, I started the Do It Center, um, where we take a more holistic approach of in increasing the success of students with disabilities and even employees with disabilities. Um, in order to, to generalize in that way, it was important for us to get our own funding, uh, as many people do when they uh, want to do extra, uh, make extra efforts in a particular area of application. Um, and so we started grant writing and uh, the National Science Foundation has been our primary funder, but also the US Department of Education, the Department of Labor, Microsoft and other cor corporations and even private funds have been used to fund these activities. We even have a Do It Japan program starting in 2007 and uh, funded by the US Department of Education, we have the Center on Universal Design and Education, which they funded uh, this center starting in 1999, but we continue to maintain it with our other projects. The basic approach we take uh, within our IT accessibility team, but you see it even more so uh, within the Do It Center, is we have a, a, an individual focused but community building model um, where we look at stakeholders like yourself, if you're teaching a class, designing a class, or you're just here to, to learn more about this topic, uh, but they contribute to a success of individuals with disabilities. So these various groups can erect barriers for people with disabilities, or they can help make things more inclusive of people with disabilities. Um, so we have at the, the um, center of this spoke of the wheel, uh, the success of people with disabilities in higher education and careers. And then some of the stakeholders we work with are people with disabilities. Uh, so in our IT accessibility team, we work with students with disabilities to help them gain access to technology but also family members in the Do It Center will work with family members, parents uh, primarily of young teenagers with disabilities, and then peers and near peers and adult mentors and allies of other sorts. Um, uh, community groups, special programs, service providers like our own disability resources for students and disability stu services offices on our own campus here. K-12 teachers to help students be prepared uh, to come to college, uh, post-secondary administrators, and of course, faculty and staff, employers, technology vendors to make IT more inclusive of and accessible to people with disabilities, legislators, policymakers, and funding agencies. We work with all these people. Uh, what we find is sometimes uh, some stakeholders are not really doing their share. Uh, and so that can include faculty or it can, it depends on the faculty member. And so this presentation will help faculty members get more engaged in making sure their courses are inclusive of people with disabilities. We have two basic approaches in all that we do. When we're working with students with disabilities, we're promoting self-determination. And that's just a very broad term, which means the tech, that students with disabilities will have access to the technology, uh, the, the uh, skill set, um, the mentoring, the networking, the things that they need uh, to be successful, all of those tools that we all need in that case. Um, and then we're working with faculty and staff and institutions and technology company, the companies, the broad um, approach that we have is universal design. So I'll be talking about that framework. So by an inclusive environment in a class or um, some other campus offering, I think of it meaning that everyone who meets the requirements with or without accommodations is encouraged to participate. So that everyone feels welcome and is fully engaged in accessible and inclusive environments and activities. And so give you a, just a quick example. If your introductory video in your online course uh, where you spend uh, three or four minutes welcoming your class is not accurately captioned, 
uh, then it's not going to be accessible to some people, including people who are deaf. Um, and uh, it's not going to make a student who is deaf feel welcome in your class. Uh, it's pretty clear to them that you haven't thought about accessibility in a proactive way. So just a uh, quick things we'll talk about is just really quickly history, legal basis for accessibility, and then the two approaches, accommodations only or universal design uh, for get, gaining access uh, for students with disabilities, principles and practices, resources and Q and A's. And as I, I mentioned, we're gonna have some tips, some very specific tips uh, that you can use to make your course more accessible. Uh, here's a little one minute history lesson of the evolution of responses to human differences, including disability. Um, in, in er earlier days, there were uh, many efforts to eliminate or exclude or at least segregate people with disabilities. Um, then in the middle of the last century, a big effort as far as curing and rehabilitating and even accommodating students with disabilities. Uh, the uh, World War II really contributed to this when we had um, af individuals who had um, suffered from um, injuries in battle, uh, but actually survived multiple industries uh, of these injuries and came home um, where in earlier wars, they would have died on the battlefield. Uh, but the other uh, big factor was they also came home with the GI Bill. And so a lot of these uh, veterans went to college. And so our colleges and universities had to really uh, take stock of this and make their, their um, programs more inclusive with a focus on accommodations, which I'll define in a minute. Uh, but now we're in the age of social justice in so many different ways and with so many different groups. Um, but there's been a, a civil rights movement for individuals with disabilities, uh, as there have been movements for racial ethnic minorities and women and other marginalized groups. And so in this particular era, uh, then the focus is on inclusion um, and universal design, both proactive um, approaches, uh, sending the message, why should we be surprised when a student with a disability shows up in our classes and act, oh no, what am I going to do, uh, when we know they have a right social justice, in, that they have a right uh, to be part of our class, so we should anticipate them coming. The legal basis goes way back to 1990, or 1973, which surprises a lot of people, um, particularly when it's online learning, because we didn't have the internet back then. So the law was Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. A similar act, but much more uh, broadly applied, is uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that act, uh, which was um, provided, I've got some power here, to put it off, <laughs> which, was, which was enacted in 1990, and its 2008 amendments, is very similar to 504, but more broadly applied to uh, transportation and just about anything in, in society. Um, these two laws are not uh, laws that are full of a lot of standards or anything. They are civil rights legislation. And so they don't say what the rules are in making your website accessible. What they do say is if you have a website or you have a course or whatever you're offering, you must make it inclusive of individuals with disabilities, must make it accessible to them. And then the final thing in our state is we have Washington State Policy Number 188. And it really reiterates uh, Section 504 and the ADA um, and uh, basically just uh, provides some detail about how we need to implement um, those laws within our own uh, state, the whole state of Washington. Like you have to have a coordinator of IT accessibility, uh, which I am here at the university, things like that. So for most of us, we're not working in the disability services office, and so we don't need to know all the, the definitions of uh, disability um, and uh, what they imply as far as a person's functions. Um, I think it's easier just to think about ability on a continuum, that everyone in this room and, um, and elsewhere has an ability. We may not have a disability, but we all have an ability in per certain categories. So here we have a double-edged arrow from not able to able on the right-hand side and a list of abilities. So just a couple examples, the ability to understand English. Uh, someone in this group might rate themselves a little low in this category, and it might be because English is not their first language, and so they don't feel that they're as, as competent as maybe the average person who, who where English is their first language. It also could be related to a learning disability, that they would uh, think that they're, where their un, the ability to understand English is affected. So the point is for um, rating an ability, it isn't just the opposite of a disability, um, but in, in a particular ability level uh, can be for multiple reasons. Same with social norms. A person might have um, a disability that affects their ability to really pick up on social cues and communicate in small groups and so forth. 
uh, they might rate low, low on this category then, or it might be because they're, they're growing up in a different culture than the one, one that's common here in the United States. Um, so we can go down this list, the ability to see, uh, could be related to a disability if you rate yourself low. It might be because you, uh, you're, you're on a shaky internet connection, you have the, the visual turned off, and so you don't have an ability to see the screen. When I give a talk like this, I just imagine that one of you is calling in by phone and doesn't see the screen. And so that prompts me, it reminds me that I have to use the words, I have to describe what's on the screen. I can't just say, look here or according to this list and not say what the list is. The ability to hear or walk or read print, write with a pen or a pencil, the ability to communicate verbally, to tune out distraction, to learn and to manage physical and mental health. This is just a short list of the many abilities that we all have. And my guess is I, if we, we passed around a little uh, Google Doc or whatever, and you needed to rate yourself on a scale in all these areas, there are probably no two of us that would rate ourselves exactly the same way when you look at the whole collection. A couple other things that's worth thinking about when you're working with students with disabilities is races, races and ethnicities, uh, gender identities and disabilities um, and other characteristics may not be obvious. Um, some Faculty, I'll say, well, do you have any students with disabilities in your class? And they say, well, no. Well, how do you know that? Well, I just look around the room or look in the Zoom windows and nobody seems to have a disability. Well, most disabilities do not show. Certainly things like learning disabilities, attention deficits and, and health impairments and so forth. So we can't trust our judgment on who has a disability in our class by the way that they look. Another characteristic is that fewer than a third of students with disabilities report them to the disability services office on any campus. Uh, the reason for this is personal. Uh, so I can't speak for anyone else, but I can tell you what I've heard from students with disabilities over uh, many, many, many years. Uh, some are embarrassed about their disability. Some worry about discrimination of a faculty member if that faculty member knows that they have particularly a learning disability or mental illness, things that uh, have some stigma uh, associated with them. And so you also can't re re you can't rely on those letters you get from disability services uh, to tell you what accommodations are approved for a particular student uh, and say, well, that's I have three students with disabilities because I have three letters. Well, uh, you just have to multiply that by three uh, to make a good guess of how many students with disabilities are in your class. So um, the point I'm making with these two first items is is you, don't, you do not know who those people are who have disabilities in your class. And so universal design you'll see kind of is an approach that helps you um, deal with that issue. Campuses primarily offer accommodations to individuals after an inaccessibility is discovered. Um, and so it's like, well, you know, we don't think about accessibility too much. We kind of design our classes for the average student. And then voila, a student with a disability is in the class and you have to kind of scramble to redo the documents and caption the videos or whatever needs to be done for that particular student. And so that doesn't create an equitable opportunity for that student when they have to maybe wait for their syllabus um, because it's in an inaccessible PDF document um, or they have to wait for videos to be captioned for them um, or other accommodations to be placed in effect. And so that makes it um, unfortunate for that student. All of, sudden, all of a sudden on day one, they're already behind. And it's important to consider intersectionality. Uh, so the students with disabilities don't always just have one disability. So they can have multiple disabilities they're dealing with. And there's that interaction between those two issues. But they also might have other um, characteristics that place them in um, underserved populations, race, ethnicity, gender, and so forth, that can affect their performance in your class as well. And so that really fits in with what we're trying to do around the campus um, here at the University of Washington to deal with diversity and really uh, support a diverse student body. Um, and we in our group and many others, but really promote the idea that disability is, is just one diversity characteristic and so should be considered in those efforts. Even efforts that may focus on, on one group, like um, efforts that are reaching out to Black students, um, it's important to remember that there are Black students that have disabilities as well. Um, and so they, we, we don't want to discriminate against a subset of the group that we're working with. Um, and so there are um, quite a few accommodations that are um, coming up uh, in increasing in numbers. 
uh, because of going online with the pandemic. And two that really have a kind of are kind of breaking the back of disability resources for students here on our campus is making inaccessible documents accessible, uh, mainly reformatting PDFs. In this uh, Wednesday, third uh, third um, third Thursday at three o'clock sessions like I'm doing today, one of them is focused on uh, PDF files, we reformatting PDFs. And another one actually is, is focused on looking at for alternatives to PDFs. Can you make PDFs accessible? Absolutely. Um, but you should invest some time in learning how to do that. Um, and there can be issues related to it, whether you're using a Macintosh or a PC. And so you have to invest some time to make that happen. Um, I teach online. Uh, and I don't use any PDFs. Often people use PDFs for their syllabus and I, I don't. Um, it's harder to make it accessible and it's not really necessary. I create my, uh, my syllabus in Word and then I also copy and paste it in the pages of the learning management system. So those are the two options I give students to read the syllabus and I don't have to deal with the, the complications of making accessible PDFs. And then captioning videos, and this means accurately captioning videos, not just using the uh, captioning feature on YouTube uh, that is not very accurate and calling it good. Um, so many people do that, that it just makes me, uh, I, I feel like they just don't know that there is an editing feature within um, YouTube where they can go in and, and correct those misspellings and the punctuation and so forth. And when you think about it for a minute, is that kind of a mean trick? If you have a student who is deaf in your class or even an English language learner who rely on captions, if you give them captions that don't have the right punctuation and spelling, that's kind of a mean trick, I think. I think we'd all agree. Uh, and there are other uh, ways that you can make your videos um, captioned accurately as well. Um, and that's the focus of one of our Thursday afternoon sessions uh, coming up, uh, which you can find on the Accessible IT website. I'll put a URL here up in the last slide. So rather than focusing on accommodations only, where after the fact we remediate documents, we give extra time on, on tests and so forth, we should think about some of these accommodations that maybe uh, we should think about how we could build this accessibility into the design of the product or environment, which in this case is an online course. Um, and so we should consider that. Um, and that leads us to the definition of universal design. It is that, exactly that, that you're doing. So universal design, the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. Um, and so we look through some of those accommodations we give, like um, you know, inaccessible documents perhaps that we remediate. Could we have made that document accessible? And so that student would need that wouldn't need that accommodation or captioning the same thing. Could we make our videos, have them with captions um, and, and have them accurately um, presented? Um, and then they, a student would need that accommodation. Often I get questions, particularly at the end of a talk like this, well, you know, I use PDFs that I link to and I, I use uh, videos that aren't mine and so forth. You can work on uh, getting captions on videos that don't you don't own um, and you can, you can um, you know, work on making PDFs that someone else creates more accessible. Um, but for most of us that teach classes, I think that's beyond what maybe we'll be willing to do, invest in as far as time. Um, and so um, you, the, the point is throughout this talk today is you don't have to do everything, but if you do some things, um, even just some things where you avoid creating a barrier, then your course is gonna be more accessible. We don't after all wanna put the disability resources for students office out of business. So they'll have plenty of work to do still, uh, but they won't be redoing um, accommodations over and over again. So uh, I have an example of a, a, uh, a universally designed product on the screen. Um, remember those olden days when I used to go to conferences in person? Well, and then we get name tags. So the image on the screen is of a name tag and you can see there's a lanyard uh, connected to it. Um, and uh, it's a little bit different than your typical lanyard at a conference. Uh, that's probably the most popular way people like to have their name tags. Uh, I don't know about you, but one of my complaints about name tags at, that are in lanyards is they just are, fall too low on your body. And if you kind of jerk them up, then it's almost like a little bib. And so I'm not really, li I'm not really liking that because I feel like the name tag should be about your, showing your name to someone else. Because I already know who my, my name is, so I don't have to look at it. And the other frustration too is if you turn the, if you're in the reception hall and everyone has a lanyard, about 50% of them seem to be turned backwards. And so there's a blank. Uh, 
And so we set about and do it coming up with a, a good name tag holder for our events uh, within our programs. And this is what we came up with. People like lanyards. And so even though I personally don't, we provide a lanyard because people like them. But at the bottom of the lanyard, there's a, there's a ring. And then we attach to that ring uh, the plastic name tag holder, which has a clip on it and a pin. And so within our product, there's the flexibility that you can choose how you want to affix the name tag on your body. You can use the lanyard, you can clip the lanyard off and use the clip to uh, connect to a, a collar. Um, and then the pin, if you don't have a collar, you can use that particular one. And also we put the name of the person on the name tag on both sides. Um, and so if, you, if, if you're using the lanyard and it flips over in the, the reception, your name still shows. So this isn't rocket science here. This is a commercial product, these name tags that we order for ourselves. Um, but it's this idea in universal design that you at least make some attempt to please more people by, by incorporating flexibility in the product you create rather than creating different products. So this is different than going to a conference when they say, would you like a lanyard or a pin or a, a clip? name tag. Because knowing me, I may want the choice of one of those one day and something else in the second day of the conference. Uh, so anyway, so that's an idea of how you um, apply universal design. You think, how can I build in some flexibility in what I'm doing? And so we'll, we're talking about then applying that idea to online courses. So the uh, characteristics of a universally designed product then is including a course is it's accessible. You technically can access it, including people with disabilities. With the standard technology, you can access the content, which would mean like the, doc, the content in a document or the content presented in a video and so forth. But it's also usable. Uh, we have someone on our staff, Hadi, who will sometimes report about products. He's testing for accessibility since he does a lot of that. Uh, and what the company did is they created a product that's not really accessible to someone who's blind as Hadi is and using a screen reader to read aloud the text. Uh, but instead of really building in accessibility from the get-go, they have created a lot of uh, shortcut keys, sequences of keys where, so, where, where Hadi and someone else who is blind could, uh, could just uh, click those keys and get to all the functions of that product. Uh, well, I think you would probably agree that that's not really very usable for Hadi. It's technically accessible, but it's not very usable for him to, what is he gonna do, memorize all these? They could be, you know, 50, 100 of them. Uh, he's gonna print something in Braille, like a little table to have by his computer. I don't know how you do that, but any of those solutions uh, do not result in a usable product. And so you want your course to be usable as well as technically accessible and then inclusive. And that may, mainly means that people are using the same product in an online class, they can interact in small groups together um, and do other activities in the class together. They don't have to have a whole different uh, thing that they do like an alternative assignment. Sometimes an alter alternative assignment is necessary, but it should be after you've investigated uh, if they might be able to, to um, uh, participate in the um, other class activities that the other students are doing. Now, the, the good news is we've actually applied universal design very broadly uh, and the example of uh, curb cuts uh, on the screen right now is a picture that appeared in the daily, our, our University of Washington student newspaper in 1970, part of an article. And uh, there's a young man in a wheelchair. Uh, and on the back of his wheelchair, he has a sign that in capital letters says, ramp the curbs, get me off the street. And so he's a protester of one, probably of several back then in 1970. Uh, and there was a lot of pushback on that. Uh, can you imagine facing uh, the University of Washington, all the curbs we have, uh, hills and so forth, and going um, uh, going through all of those designs and building in the curb cuts? And people claimed it was prohibitively expensive. And after all, how many people would really use a curb cut anyway? You know, how many people do we have in wheelchairs? Um, but as you know, long story short, uh, we have adopted. Um, curb cuts as a standard practice in sidewalk design. Uh, it would be unusual if someone put a sidewalk in your neighborhood and it didn't have curb cuts in it. I think there would be uh, people protesting. Wouldn't be people with disabilities probably, but people that uh, use those curb cuts for delivery carts and um, baby carriages and maybe even skateboards. Um, so this is an example of a universal design uh, practice that has been widely accepted, uh, particularly in the United States, but in other countries as well. 
Now, if you look at the universal design of IT, of technology, which like I said, in the, the next series, part of the series of this uh, Thursday afternoon um, program, you'll get to get into these details. But there are basically two things to think about. You want to make sure that your technology builds in accessibility as much as possible as regular features. We see this in our, our smartphones. With your far smartphone, you can actually uh, change the color of the foreground and the background and change the size of the characters on your screen. Uh, you can even have the, the phone talk to you. Actually, mine talks to me a little bit too much, but that's another problem. Uh, and uh, so that's what you would like to do. But some things are not going to be built into a computer system, for example, like a Braille uh, embosser that a person who's blind can use to produce Braille uh, using Braille's translation software. Um, and so in that case, what you want to make sure is that you in the IT design that you ensure compatibility with assistive technology. So someone using a screen reader can use your IT, all the functions of it, um, and so forth. And so that's universal design of IT in a brief. And then we talked about videos. For all universal design, including universal design of your course, there are a lot of beneficiaries. Um, and so if we just take a look at captioning, the beneficiaries include people who are unable to hear the audio, uh, people who are English language learners, uh, people in a noisy environment like the airport, or a noiseless one like in a baby's room while the baby's sleeping, uh, someone who has a slow internet connection, someone who wants to know the spelling of words, that's kind of everybody, I think, and then people that need to find the content quickly, because if you have the right tools, uh, like we do in the Do It website where we have a lot of videos, uh, you could search through all those captions and find in our large collection of videos where the, the word blindness is, is used, or you could use some other search term if it's, because they're in a text-based format. And so that's the idea of universal design where it can benefit more than just people with disabilities, where an accommodation, as I mentioned earlier, is for one person. You're remediating a document for that one person. Uh, and a faculty member may, if they put some effort into it, use accessible documents in the future, but many times, and I would guess to say, I, I think most, faculty members don't. They go back to, or disability services will, will remediate those documents again in a future iteration of the class if someone needs um, accessible documents. So we're not gonna go into this in detail, but I just want you to know that there's a, a rich history and a lot of uh, principles and guidelines and practices uh, that are part of the universal design framework. Um, and so uh, I just am going to briefly say what they are, not the, the principles, but there are seven principles for the universal design of everything. Uh, and these are from the 1990s, so they've been around a long time. Uh, first applied to physical environment, when you'll hear about universal design of homes, so people can age in place and so forth. So a lot of applications in the physical environment or even to, um, uh, to appliances and uh, other te technology, like how can you design a microwave oven so elderly citizens can use it uh, pretty easily and so forth, but building in those features within the product. And then came along universal design for learning, um, which um, from, comes from the CAST Center, and they developed three principles of universal design for learning um, that really zero in on uh, pedagogy in a course, particularly a, a curriculum development, and making sure that, that these principles are followed to make those um, materials accessible to people with disabilities. And then uh, if, as far as IT, uh, the best principles I think to look toward uh, for guidance in online learning um, are the four principles that underpin the content web content accessibility guidelines. And even though it says web, um, it can apply to other the design of other IT as well. And even though it says accessibility, it's really more universal design because it isn't just about disability. They have guidelines for um, addressing issues related to English language learners and, and slow readers and so forth and people in different languages. Um, so anyway, uh, if we were doing a workshop, we could go through these. It's kind of fun to see what they say. But rather than do that today, in a nutshell, what does this mean? What does it say to me? Uh, this might not be a perfect translation if you put all these principles together. Um, but if you follow these two principles, you'll be a long way to making your course accessible and usable. So the first one is to provide multiple ways for participants to learn. So multiple ways they can learn, like using a video and then maybe a document as well or a website. And so two different ways they can access the content or more. And to demonstrate what they have learned, and that would be making sure that you 
test students in multiple ways, uh, give students credit for their communications within the, the bulletin board system, uh, answering questions along the way, um, have some other small assignments that will, um, they'll have a chance to show what they've learned and then maybe a large project or two. Um, so just thinking of different ways that students can demonstrate what they have learned. Uh, and then um, multiple ways to engage. Um, I, in an online course in my syllabus, um, I, at the very beginning, just welcome them and, and tell them I'd love to meet with them if they want to talk to me about their learning needs or anything else related to the course. Um, and I suggest to them that they choose you know, how they'd like to meet. And that could be uh, using the learning management system. Uh, could be via email, it could be on Zoom, um, and it could be Skype or, or whatever. They can choose, uh, and if we can make that happen, we'll make that happen. Personally, I like to meet with students on Zoom, uh, but I have to remind myself uh, as that it's not about me, it's about them. So just giving them that agency where they can actually choose how to communicate with you. Um, and my experience in the past is students that want to communicate via, via email, I think, uh, I don't know, because they don't have to give me a reason. It might be because they're a little embarrassed about their English skills, or they have a speech impairment, or um, they have a learning disability that makes it difficult for them to get their, their thoughts out. Um, but the point is that anybody can make the choice uh, for themselves and ensure that all technologies and facilities and services and resources and strategies are accessible to individuals with a wide variety of abilities and other characteristics. Um, are you gonna ever be perfect about this? No, but at least you can think about it. Think about the variety of uh, people that might be in your class. And so we're focusing on online classes today, but we also have a lot of checklists and other resources for physical spaces. Um, I'm gonna give you the URL for the Do It website um, uh, at the end of this presentation, um, but you can go there and find a checklist, for instance, on how to make a makerspace so it's more inclusive of people with disabilities, or design a STEM lab, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, so you, or even um, a recreation facility. So we have a lot of checklists that have been developed over the years in consultation with people with disabilities and also service providers from other campuses. Uh, so those are kind of the two things. You just give people multiple ways to do things, um, and then you ensure uh, accessibility. The first example I gave about using a video and a, a written material as the two ways to, to uh, learn. Um, if you look at the second principle, then you need to make sure that that video is designed in an accessible way, and the document or website is also designed in an accessible way. That, that, that's what the second um, uh, condition uh, implies. Uh, I came up with this in part because I actually think universal design for learning should imply that things are accessible, but I tend to go to a lot of talks at conferences and so forth, and I go to talks on universal design for learning, and often they don't talk about accessibility. And so, uh, and some actually would think that, well, if you have a video and you have um, written material, that's enough if they can access one of them, but not necessarily both. Well, but it's ideal if they can access both. Some people will watch the video and read the uh, the written materials both. That would have been me. That was the kind of student I was. <laughs> okay, so whenever you're de developing a course, then you should consider the characteristics of students who might enroll <coughs> and the assistive technology that they might be using. It could be multiple keyboards and so forth, all types. And so I like to think of four people I know when I'm teaching a class online. Uh, and that, and if I make my class accessible to them, uh, then it's going to be pretty accessible to lots of other people as well. Uh, but you also should think about English language skills and cultures and interests and comfort using technology. Uh, some people are more comfortable than others. So how can you keep that, um, you know, the need for knowing about how to use technology kind of at a minimum because you want to teach the content in your class. So the first one on uh, three, four pictures here is Zane. And uh, these are all people I know, uh, usually through the Do It program, but we can see we have Hottie on there who works for us. Um, <clears throat> Zane uh, happens to be deaf. And so she's one that will really benefit if you make uh, accurate captions on your videos. Anthony has multiple physical disabilities <coughs> and he also does not have a usable voice. And so he can, um, he can uh, select keys on a touch screen uh, if they're large. And he also uses software that'll help create 
uh, macros. And so he can get his ad, the full name and his address and so forth in, into written form quickly. Um, and so there are other technologies he uses in that, um, that department. Um, he also um, uses a telephone because uh, he, he provides phone support, <coughs> technology support uh, for parents of children who've been diagnosed with conditions similar to his own in many cases. Um, and so how does he do that? Well, he can use a voice synthesizer uh, so he can compose his thoughts uh, and then uh, the computer will read aloud what, what he composed. Uh, and he has a, 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 a phone um, connected to his computer. And so he can, any method for dialing and, and so forth. And he can then make phone calls and then he can, uh, can talk with his computer generated voice. Uh, so this may sound complex and there are literally thousands, thousands of products, assistive technology that people like Anthony can use to get access to computing. Some people think in order to have a student like that in your class, you need to know about all this technology they're using. Well, not really. Uh, people in my IT accessibility team can, can tell you about that. Uh, but really, there's one main thing to think about when as an issue with Anthony, if he's using technology, and that he, all that he has there uh, can emulate the keyboard. And so you can assume that assistive technology will emulate everything on the keyboard. So if you use a standard keyboard, someone with all that technology can do everything that you do on the keyboard. But you can't assume that they will, it will fully emulate the mouse. Um, and so that comes into play, not real often with you as an instructor, but if you're using IT other than in your learning management system or, or websites and whatever, you can test to see, can that website be accessed with a keyboard alone? Um, can that IT be used without using a mouse? So set your mouse away and you can tell whether that um, rule is being violated. There are a lot of other accessibility rules as well, but that's one thing you can actually test for. Then we have Jessie and she has multiple learning disabilities. And she um, has difficulty getting her thoughts down on paper or even with the keyboard and also reading. Uh, so the, the, the multiple learning disabilities uh, result in that combination of challenges for her. And so actually dictating to the computer is not something that's difficult for her to do, uh, no matter how your course is designed. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, but then she needs to read back the content of um, documents that you're presenting um, and website content and so forth. Um, and so in order for her to read aloud, for a computer to read aloud what's on the screen, she needs to have access to the text. Uh, and so for instance, if you're using a PDF and it's just scanned in, um, all, her, her computer can't read it aloud because it, it can't uh, decipher exactly what that content is. Now there's some translation uh, software and so forth that can help do that. But basically to think about, students with learning disabilities that one thing they may have a challenge with is accessing the text. Uh, this is a value to um, English language learners because there are some English language learners that might choose to use text to speech software um, to read things. It might be more efficient for them than just reading them in the printed uh, format. And then there's Hadi, I already talked about Hadi a bit. Um, and so imagine Hadi, I have to imagine him might, teaching, might be teaching the class that I'm I'm teaching because he teaches online. And uh, so his, his basic access issue is similar to Jesse's, even though their disabilities are quite different. He needs access to the text so his screen reader can read it aloud to him. And so text that's embedded in an image, for instance, uh, his screen reader is not gonna pick up on it unless you use alternative text uh, that can be entered in and his screen reader will be able to pick that up. But he also needs some formatting because you can imagine if he's reading a 25 page paper and he has access to the text, but it's not in formatted in a way that he has access to. It'd be like reading a big strong string, maybe like one sentence. And so he can't tell whether there are lists, can't tell whether the heading's a, a level one heading or a level two heading or whatever. And so he can't really skim through the document to the part he wants to, to um, access. Um, and so that's very difficult for them, for him. And so uh, what he needs is formatting of that PDF or that Word document or that website that would format, say, the headings. And so that would point out to him heading one, heading two, and so forth, but also would warn him when a list is coming up, like a bulleted list. And there's, there are also formatting requirements for tables and, uh, and so forth. But uh, the idea is to uh, use those formatting features within your, your um, the, the system that you're using for creating a document, like Microsoft Word, 
um, you can add um, to images alternative text. Um, and you also can format um, your, your headings and your lists and stuff by using the styles that are provided already. It's not a lot of extra work, uh, but sometimes it just seems easier to just put it, you know, select the text and put it in bold and call it good. Uh, but that's not gonna work well for Hottie. So those are some things to think about kind of on a high level of what um, students uh, might be facing or instructors in a course. And so the idea here is to really focus on the product and not on the, the, uh, the, the limitations of the person. So when your, your course, when you look at your course, you can compare it to when you plant lettuce, if it does not grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look for reasons it's not doing well. That may need fertilizer, it might need water, how about sun? Um, I mean, I, I'm very poor in this department. I don't blame the plants in my house for dying because I just tend to forget to water them. Um, that's not a good quality of someone who has plants in their house. Um, this was a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. Uh, so I'm not sure he was thinking about universal design, but this is what universal design is like. When you design your course, you might think, well, some students aren't gonna do very well on this, um, but you want to minimize that. So by looking at your course, and seeing what you can do on your end um, to make it more inclusive. Even this presentation today, I thought of some things. <coughs> I'm using the standard template. Um, and so uh, you can get access to this uh, PowerPoint from our website and it's designed in an accessible format. Uh, and if you use a standard template, often those standard templates either offered in Word or the university templates are designed to encourage you to make your slides accessible rather than just starting with a blank slate and, and selecting a text box or something to put your text in. I use clear and consistent layouts, not a very fancy layout, um, but not distracting uh, to someone, let's say, who has attention deficits. Um, large sans serif fonts can help someone with, a, with visual impairments, but also can help students with dyslexia and other reading related disabilities um, be able to read the text better. Um, I have uncluttered pages, high contrast. I spell out acronyms. And it, I speak the content presented visual, visually, um, and I turn the captions on. And so there are other things you might come up with that you could do in a presentation, but there's some simple ones that you can just end up doing uh, routinely to make your PowerPoint uh, and Zoom presentations in your course or, or otherwise um, accessible. So now I'm gonna share <coughs> 20 tips for teaching an online accessible course an accessible online course. Uh, and you'll find this, I'll give you the URL at the end um, as a document that's part of the Do It collection. It was created with a lot of input from instructors, but also from students with disabilities. We often will host panels of students with disabilities and I pay particular attention to what they say about challenges they're facing in working online. And some of them are really simple things that anybody could do. And so sometimes faculty members get caught up in what they can't do because they don't know enough about technology or whatever. They're pretty simple things in this list of 20. So if this is to help you get started. I'm not saying if you do these 20 things, you're done. Um, but anything that you do in that list is making your course more accessible and may have result in reducing the number of accommodations students with disabilities have in your class. Um, and so there's a fair amount of, amount of research that's out there. So I reviewed articles and reports from online instructors and the students um, and actually have gone through and, and updating this list periodically as I work with, with teachers and, and students to come up with more ideas, but trying to keep it to, uh, to 20. So uh, here's one of the ones that's very simple tip. Uh, and also a big complaint of students with disabilities is it's not real clear with how the course is organized and how you get one from one path part to the next, like if you go into the uh, learning uh, the modules, you know, it doesn't tell you at the end of a module, what do I do next? It might be better, for instance, at the end of that uh, module to say, next, uh, go to the discussion board and answer this question or something, you know, that doesn't guide you through the class. And then also inconsistency. I'm sure that happened in a lot of the courses that went um, online because of the pandemic, as faculty members are quickly throwing the things that they have online. But now it's time to go back and, and see if you can make them a little more consistent, uh, have consistent fonts and organizational schemes. Use a text format, talk to, I talked already about why that's important. And Hadi would really benefit from you structuring those headings and your lists and your tables and so forth. And so you can learn how to do that. There are standard practices. You can Google it, uh, depending what software package you're using. Um, even in your learning management system, 
uh, we have a, a software ally that combines with Canvas to give you hints on accessibility, uh, but also you can look at the Q&As about um, how to make certain things accessible. Um, descriptive wording for hyperlinks. Uh, this is also beneficial for someone who's blind using a screen reader. If they go to a website or your content um, in a learning management system, one of those pages, and you have links to resources, uh, they can use their screen reader to skip through all those links and have them read aloud to them. And so they can see what pages uh, to that they can link to without reading all the surrounding text to explain what the link is to. So if Hadi goes to a page and you've got a whole bunch of of uh, links on your website or your learning management page, uh, a bunch of them, and he just wants to see what it's linking to. And he, you name them all the same, because it looks kind of pretty and consistent for them all to say, click here, click here, click here. That's what Hottie hears if he wants to look and see what links there are. So he'll just hear, here, click, click here, click here, click here. So he has to go back to the beginning uh, and he has to read all that content so he can get that surrounding text to see what he's linking to, or he can just randomly go through these links and, and you know see what they link to. Uh, so that's a very easy thing to do. It takes a little work to go back in your class now and have descriptive wording. So you'd say do it website or UW website rather than click here, click here. So just descriptive, keep it pretty short. But so a person has an idea what they're linking to. Um, as I've said, this is my personal opinion anyway, uh, avoid using PDFs or learn how to make them accessible. And we can teach you how to do that. Um, in one of these sessions or, uh, and we have even resources online for helping with that. Uh, don't use uh, scanned image PDFs. And so accessible HTML is ideal. And that's what uh, is, if you put something in your content page, that's uh, HTML, kind of the language of the web. Um, and that is easiest to make accessible. But even if you wanna have um, a document, Microsoft Word is easier to make accessible. So you can keep it pretty easy. Um, I use an attachment for a document only once in the classes I teach online, and that's for the syllabus. Um, everything else is in the content pages or it's linked from there. Um, but the reason I have that document in, uh, is in the case of the syllabus, it's the one case where I really want the students to be able to download that, that document and make it their own. So they can go into that syllabus and they can make notes um, in the timeline area to break down some of the assignments and so forth. They can take out content in my syllabus that doesn't really apply to them. Uh, so if they don't have a disability, for instance, they can take out that whole section and some other things. And so they can slip, simplify that, that uh, syllabus. Some faculty members have pushed back on that by saying, well, it's intellectual content that's mine, you know, and I'm the owner of this company. Well, you are, um, but I have, I have never found anybody that wants to steal my syllabus, frankly. And if they wanted to, it doesn't really matter what format it's in, you can easily steal it uh, anyway. And then the text descriptions of content in images. We talked about that, and that's for screen readers to pick up on. Also, a very easy thing to do. And in Canvas uh, and Blackboard and other learning management systems, the system will prompt you if you put an image in. It'll ask for the alt text, but now you know what it's why it's there. Uh, some people ask me, well, what's you know what are the rules? Well, you can find some some resources about alternative text online, particularly long descriptive texts like. A big, an image where you need to break it down in parts and so forth. So this can get really complicated for a complicated image. But for your standard image, keep it short. Imagine what a person needs to know in order to follow uh, your um, instruction. And so that name tag that I gave us an example a while back, I did describe that image so you didn't have to actually see it. Um, and hopefully I described it well so you could follow along if you didn't um, have access to it. Uh, so that, that's what I'd say. Think about what would you tell somebody on the telephone um, what, what's on the screen that's important, that's relevant uh, to the topic of discussion. Uh, people will uh, tell me all the time, people who are blind, that sometimes people make their alternative text too long and too detailed. They just want it to be crisp. You know, just let me know what I'm missing. And also you can put in there whether it's uh, just decorative content too. So they don't know that they just, that they didn't miss anything by not knowing the content in that image. Um, so that's fairly easy so far. Uh, used large, bold, sans serif fonts, um, uncluttered pages, plain backgrounds. We, I talked about that as far as my PowerPoints here. High contrast color combinations uh, and problematic ones for those who are colorblind avoided. Uh, there are color checkers. You can check and see if colors you use on the page can be distinguished 
um, by individuals who are colorblind. There are a lot of different issue, uh, types of colorblindness as far as which colors and how severe it is. Um, I actually prefer to just uh, make sure that um, that the what uh, whatever I'm providing uh, or asking people to do doesn't require that they distinguish color. And so I might even use two buttons where one is red and one is green. And those are really difficult for many people with, um, with colorblindness to distinguish. Uh, but I might have the green one as a triangle and the red one as a square. Um, and so a person, we talk about the green triangle um, and a person, if they can't tell the color, it doesn't matter because they can tell it's a, a circle. Um, so, um, so anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's something to think about. Make sure videos are captioned and audio described. Audio description is adding some audio content in for someone who's blind watching the video. Is it done as commonly? Ideally, we do that with all of our videos or create videos that where you speak all the content and then you don't need the audio description. <coughs> Avoid using a large number of technology tools. There's so much cool technology out there. It's really out there. It's really tempting to use it. But remember that some people are not, don't find using new technology all that much fun. And some of these smaller products you might find out there that are really cool do not uh, have accessibility features. They haven't thought about accessibility. How do you know? Well, you can go uh, and you can try using the software without, with the keyboard alone. Um, but another way is just go to their website and see if they have an accessibility page. If they don't, my guess is it's probably not designed to be very accessible. So, but it's just a general um, guideline for everybody because uh, you don't wanna make the technology you're using a big part of your course in most cases, unless you're teaching about technology tools. Um, and so uh, you don't want people to be, um, <clears throat> be hampered by a lot of technology that you really didn't need to use. <coughs> Address a wide range of technical skills, pointing to resources to gain skills. Imagine in your Canvas course that you have a student in there that this is the first Canvas course they've taken. Most of your students have probably done many campus, Canvas courses by the time they're in yours. Um, but for that, just give some guidelines to that particular student, not individually, but in your syllabus or an announcement to say, if you're new at using Canvas, I suggest you, you watch this video or go to this Q&A um, to get started. Uh, because there's so much in the resources pages, they don't know where to start. Um, and you know what you're going to be doing in the class, so you know which resource is good to start with. Make sure the content's presented in multiple ways. There we get into universal design for learning. Um, and multiple ways, we offer multiple ways to communicate and to collaborate. Um, if I have small groups, uh, this is uh, in, in online or on site, and make sure to give them instructions on how I expect them to work together um, in order to participate. Multiple ways to demonstrate what they've learned, lots of different ways to, to test for learning and address a wide range of language skills, just using plain English, spelling out acronyms and, and uh, defining jargon, things like that. Make your instructions and expectations clear. One of the other top things that students with disabilities complain about, um, students on the autism spectrum and students with some types of learning disabilities are particularly benefit when you make your instructions really clear, but a lot of people do, a disability or not. Make sure examples and assignments are relevant to a diverse audience and use outlines and scaffolding tools to kind of help students get through the content, uh, provide adequate opportunities for practice um, and adequate time provided for activities. One way to, to do that is to put all of your assignments in the class, particularly big projects and so forth in the syllabus, clearly defined. And so students can get started on those right away, allowing them to have more time essentially. Um, and giving feedback on parts of a big assignment and maybe corrective opportunities. Uh, two more quick things. Uh, so uh, using the accessibility checkers, uh, you can Google and find out where they are if you can't find them for Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, uh, PDFs and learning management systems and so forth. Uh, use those checkers that can point out uh, some things that are not accessible. And now that you've been in this presentation, you should understand why, why they're giving you the direction that they are. And when you are choosing IT uh, tools to use, check for accessibility of, on the page of the website, as I mentioned. Uh, the voluntary <clears throat> product accessibility template. You could look that up, but that's uh, the federal government's template that software companies need to, and hardware actually have to put in to talk about accessibility. But sometimes it's the marketing people that are putting them up. So you might want to check with them, with my team on that uh, for a particularly important product you're using. Um, and so uh, also there's a, a discussion list called, uh, in the, of an organization called Athen 
that has that handles a lot of these Q and A's, and they have archives where probably the product you're using has been discussed at one point in time. Uh, so, so those are some things, and I'll point you to the Do It website for details, like how do I create math and science documents that are accessible to students with visual impairments? Details like that. Um, what are some of the standards and guidelines for providing uh, captions and things like that? So in summary, universal design is an attitude, a framework, a goal, a process. It values diversity, equity, and inclusion, promotes best practices, does not lower standards. It's proactive, uh, can be implemented incrementally, is for the benefit of everyone, and minimizes the need for accommodation. So let's do that. Um, and so uh, good teaching is good teaching. So what universal design provides, or accessible design, however you want to look at it, is a lens to look at all of your teaching practices and say, is there something I could modify this particular practice um, in order to be more inclusive of, of people? Um, and so it doesn't require that you change your teaching practices a lot. So here are some resources on the screen, and we're going to put the uh, URLs in chat, uh, the, our UW Accessible Technology page. Um, and then uh, we'll also put in there the Do It Center, where you can find the Center for Universal Design and Education and Access DL, which has a lot of resources, not just our own, on how to make distance learning or online learning accessible. You also can contact me at Cheryl B at uw.edu. That's S H E R Y L B at uw.edu. So we have time for a quick question. And uh, we're running out of time here, but I'm not running away any time soon. So if you uh, have a question, you would like to stay a few, uh, a few minutes after our, our session, I'll still be here. So do we have any questions that have popped up in chat? Well, you can unmute yourself and ask a question as well. It looks like Gaby has answered most of the questions in the chat. I'm just looking through here to see. And Gaby, by the way, is the one that teaches these PDF uh, sessions in this series. One, one question I often get is, well, where do I get started? It can seem a little overwhelming. Um, and I, my answer to that is always the same, which is start somewhere. Whatever you do to make your course more accessible, it's going to be more accessible and it's going to be less need for an accommodation. Um, and even if it's not something that would be an accommodation, it's going to make it more inclusive of your students. Um, another way to look at it is think about what you're doing the first two weeks of school uh, make, and really focus in that area. So the student with a disability that does need an accommodation has some time uh, to work with disability resources for students. Uh, to get those accommodations they need and so they get their documents or other accommodations when the other students get access to those things i do see one question that has not been answered can you please recommend a solution for situations when pdf documents cannot be avoided for example in some courses we need to upload images of court documents well i would first look to see sometimes you can find that those documents have been also made available online in an accessible format. Um, otherwise, I would, as an instructor, probably leave that as an accommodation. So you would have to do the remediation yourself, but the disability services office should be warned um, enough, given enough time ahead of time to remediate those documents for you. But you're thinking along the right lines and so there are gonna be some things that are easy to do and something that's things that are hard and so the question is always along the way could i do this myself and do it now or later um, and what things will i rely on the disability services office for at least now and sometimes the the, um, the library can help you with some of these too they have an accessibility person andy andrews but other staff that know about looking for accessibility because again you might be able to find a document it's a presented in PDF, but also is in, is in an alternative format. Okay, I want folks to know that this recording will be available on our website as soon as we get the captions back. And we will have the PowerPoint posted there for you too. I just put a link in the chat and that's the page on our webinar archives page is where you'll find that when it's available. 
Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, give me the opportunity to talk about something that I feel pretty passionate about. And so I would encourage you to do one thing, just one thing, and then go from there to make your course accessible. Cool. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. Great.